Greetings MOOCers and welcome to the introductory talk on the second topic associated with the global challenge of obesity. This week we're going to address the ideas behind food addiction and the idea that the high levels of obesity that we see in our modern society might be driven at least in part by a compulsion to overeat, a compulsion that's analogous to the drug taker's compulsion to take a drug. We saw in last week's session that the prevalence of obesity has been um, steadily increasing over the past few decades. And I mentioned the idea that obesity could be driven by overeating. And it's certainly the case that in the past few decades, the prevalence of obesity has been accompanied by an increase in food availability. But it doesn't necessarily make sense that that should cause an increase in overeating. Just because more food is available doesn't necessarily mean that we should eat more. But the root cause of obesity is overeating. So what drives this overconsumption? There are many factors that can drive eating. One of the most important is reward. The idea that we find high sugar, high fat, palatable foods like chocolate more appealing, more rewarding and more pleasurable to eat. Compared to bland foods like grains and green vegetables, we experience chocolate, for example, as more rewarding. So much so that we will eat it even when we're not hungry. There's no doubt that we are more motivated to consume these rewarding foods in preference to other sorts of food, but is it possible that our natural evolved preference for energy-dense foods could tip into something more dangerous? But could we become addicted to these foods? And by addiction, I mean uncontrolled eating. Eating that's not associated with the pleasant sensations of fullness, satiation, but associated with unpleasant sensations like regret or shame, or even physical discomfort. So the idea of food addiction has been around for around 10 years or so now, and it's starting to get into the public consciousness. This slide shows a selection of stories from the online media that compare overeating with addictions to heroin or tobacco. And it's certainly clear that heroin addiction and addiction to smoking exist, but on the face of it, it might seem appealing to consider that an addiction to food also exists. Not least because understanding such a phenomenon might lead to a better understanding of how the brain controls food choice. Such criteria already exist to diagnose addiction to drugs. For a diagnosis, several but not all of these criteria need to be fulfilled. One is tolerance, needing more of the drug to achieve the same effect. Others include the development of a withdrawal syndrome after stopping use, taking more of the substance than one intends, unsuccessful attempts to stop using the substance or continued use despite unwanted consequences. So is it possible that these types of criteria could be adapted as a way of defining food addiction? Well recently that's been attempted by the adoption of the Yale food addiction scale and this scale has been proposed to be a valid means of determining whether someone is addicted to food. The scale is a questionnaire that asks the responder to think about their eating behaviour in the last year, with particular reference to palatable high sugar or high fat foods like chocolate or fried food. They're asked whether they frequently overeat, even when they're not hungry, whether they worry about eating certain foods or worry about trying not to eat them, whether overeating or the fear of overeating has resulted in them missing work or social activities, that sort of thing. By indicating how often they have these experiences or feelings. A score is generated which is used as a diagnosis for food addiction. And use of the Yale scale is starting to become rather widespread and it's been suggested that patients defined as food addicted using this scale are more susceptible to food cravings and to binge eating. And furthermore, these patients are suggested to be more impulsive and more emotionally reactive. And they may also show a greater tendency to eat during periods of stress. There is, rightly I think, a reluctance to characterise extreme forms of normal behaviour as uh, diseases or conditions. How would we decide who lies at the upper end of normal versus who lies at the lower end of food addicted, for example? Well, as with most psychiatric diseases, those decisions would be made on a case-by-case -case basis by different physicians. And there are attendant problems with that, about different diagnoses and so on. But if food addiction does exist, would it necessarily lead to obesity? Is it possible that a food addict could remain at a normal body weight? Equally, it's most likely not the case that everyone who is obese will be addicted to food. At 
any rate, what might be the consequences of acceptance by the medical community of food addiction as a real phenomenon? Might it lead to a reduction in personal responsibility by the obese? Would the overweight claim, no, it's not me, it's not my fault, it's my brain that's making me fat? Would there be a rush to medicalise the problem? Would drug companies try to develop treatments for food addiction, perhaps by adapting medicines already used for, say, alcohol dependence? How would the food industry respond? A new market could open up, foods for the food addicted. Would the government feel compelled to act to control this new public health problem, to create legislation to control our access to foods? And even if we could treat food addiction, what unintended consequences might that have on other normal human behaviours? Considering what we currently understand about the reward pathways in the brain and how they mediate the sensations of pleasure and so on, it seems to be the case that the pleasure associated with many behaviours, not just eating but also sex and caring for children, all converge in the same brain pathways. If we were able to reverse food addiction in some way by reducing the pleasure and reward associated with eating palatable foods, maybe there would be unintended consequences too. Perhaps we'd also dull our responses to the other pleasures in life, and that's surely an unwanted outcome.